so far is something which is very descriptive. Uh, the, the Xi, the screen, those properties, all that is, is, um, is just a description of how, of, well, the tools that we can use to characterize the beam and, and, its, uh, and its evolution. But we didn't tell how this thing, you know, this Xi A, is evolving with my propagation, which is really what we want to know in the end. So let's go. So the Zach's vector equation. And also talk about the Jacobi matrix. So you remember that we had this covariant equation for the sine u, the geodesic deviation equation. But you can actually show, using all the properties of the screen factors of Xi, their orthogonality and things. So exercise four can show that this implies that the A component of Xi projection satisfies the following differential equation which is very, very similar. Structure is of course the same. So Jelly's deviation equation implies this thing for the evolution of the screen projection of the separation vector. With this R A B curly R and an A B, a mixed projection of the Riemann tensor. Even Right. And this thing is called the optical tidal matrix. The reason why it's called like this is already a bit, well, you can already suspect it, and this is going to be even clearer in the following. But you see, the evolution, you can see this as a force acting. If you see that somehow lambda as a time and this as a dynamical system, well, xi, the acceleration of xi with respect to this alpha parameter is given by a force which is driven by this matrix here. And we feel, as we, we know already from uh, when we study the motion of particles, when we study tidal fields actually, we know that this thing can actually um, create some, well, uh, isotropic deformation of objects, so this would be due to the trace part of this thing, and also some distortions like shear uh, due to the uh, non-symmetric uh, well, trace free parts. So this is what we are going to talk about. I said anti-symmetric, sorry, this thing is clearly symmetric. See that we exchange A and B because of the symmetries of the Riemann tensor, this thing is a symmetric matrix. So 
So what we can do now is a very interesting decomposition of this matrix. It relies on the decomposition of the Riemann tensor over two different kinds of curvature that we call the Ricci curvature and the Weyl curvature. The Ricci curvature, as you know well, the Ricci tensor is a kind of trace of the Riemann tensor. The Weyl curvature is what is remaining, so the trace-free part from it. So the decomposition is the following. It has the same, um, the same symmetries of the Riemann tensor. In particular, if you exchange the couple mu nu and the couple with the couple rho sigma, so the result is unchanged. It is anti-symmetric with respect to the exchange of mu and nu and rho and sigma. And it has this additional property of the kind of trace free thing. Um, yeah, just uh, by the way, when I write something like this, this means one half of T mu nu minus T mu nu. There are several conventions that you can choose for that. Some people don't put the one half, some people do one half. I do put it. So why are we interested in this decomposition of the Riemann tensor? It is because it is associated with the decomposition of the, of the optical tidal matrix, which is at the same time very easy to interpret geometrically and physically. It, has, it, it is really meaningful to do this decomposition. So let me write the consequence of that on the optical tidal matrix. write this matrix R with two components. I, uh, so I don't have the multiple thing. Okay. Um, okay. We'll use the, an, an old notation that I don't like, but I'm uh, having the choice here. Something like this. between its trace, purely, or purely scalar part and its trace-free part. 
So this is completely standard. But the thing which is interesting is that those two things are associated with, respectively with, with just Ritchie and just five. Yeah, these new and Penrose. What about the five? Yeah, so that's the thing. But I don't like this notation in this context because they seem to come out of the blue. But it's just that I like to call them R and W, like Ritchie and Violet. Just in, the thing is that I, have, I don't have enough R's here. <laughs> When I'm working with LaTeX, I use MatCal and um, Matt uh, RS, uh, uh, well, the other one, the other calligraphy, but yeah, here I cannot, so. <laughs> and this is called vial focusing. So let me just write what they are in terms of the Ritchie vial. So first we have that. And size zero is and should be S one S I S two S one yes. Maybe with a minus. I'm not sure about this thing. Could be a minus. But it's not very really important here, right? So this phi zero zero only depends on the Ricci tensor, while the, this psi zero only depends on uh, on the vial tensor. Note, by the way, that we can, and this will be well. No, let me first say one thing which is just uh, the geometrical description of that. Let's do an illustration. Also, suppose for simplicity, That uh, psi zero is real, so that we have only this uh, minus plus structure and zero suggested a diagonal matrix. And let's look at the, the pattern, the forces that are so the force in terms of this uh, uh, interpretation of uh, well, the dynamical system interpretation of this equation. So, what is the force that is Created on a circular light beam. So um, on the screen, what you see would be so, okay, this is the screen. And suppose that you have a light beam that is like this. And that this is the reference ray with respect to which we have psi A. So what happens? Consider, for example, the behavior of this ray with respect to the central one. So now we have psi, psi A, which is actually just psi 1, so in the direction of x, if we call that. Right, so this is S1, S2, we call that Y, Dy, and Dx, just for so, to connect to sort of things that we know very well. All right, so the force, the tidal force that is created by the Ricci focusing part first, it's quite clear. It's always in the same direction as the vector, as the vector, as the vector psi, right? So suppose that you have no vial part, you have just that. You go to this equation. Second derivative of psi is just parallel to psi. And it's negative. So the Ricci force does something like that. Yeah. And same thing everywhere. If I'm here, same thing. The force 
force is parallel to the to, to xi and opposite. So this is the effect of Ricci. Right. And now what do we have if we consider the, the effect of, of Bile? So suppose even that this thing is positive, simplicity. So if I'm here. Right, I have a negative thing, so I, if this is parallel to Ex, I get a force which is negative as well. So something like this as well. If I am here, same thing, it's parallel, but now it's aligned one. It goes in the same direction. Yeah, same problem. This would be the effect of the vial. Right? Okay, all very standard. But if it's not clear, just tell me, because I didn't write any equation here, just use that. I would put the arrow at the same point. Why did it go up? Why did I go up? You, you're going around, but you also yeah. have this force in this point as well. Because you have um, diagonal, one is x, one is y. So at one given point, you have x and y. OK, so let me make, maybe let me write it. So if I take uh, the, so let me call, all right. Explanation of the drawing. All right. So consider, for example, sine a, which is one zero. Yes. So this corresponds to this one. Call the force F A. I like so I have B2 psi A and that's what I call R A B psi B. I can call that just for the sake of the of this discussion F A force. So here I have F as vector, <coughs> which is Pi zero zero pi zero zero plus sin zero zero minus zero. Everything applied to one zero. So this is pi zero zero one zero plus oh, sorry, minus. Psi zero, one zero. So both the Ricci force and the Bile force are applied in the same direction, the direction of x, and in the same oops, <coughs> yes, and in the same direction because phi zero zero is negative. Yeah. Okay. To prove that, because you could tell me, well, yeah, this R mu nu k mu k mu could be negative, but actually it's not because if I introduce the Einstein field equation. I get so this on you well you can do it and do the, the calculation it's really really easy given that this thing is another vector and you get minus four pi j t mu nu mu nu k mu. And if you assume uh, the the null energy condition this thing is positive and therefore the result is negative. All zero. 
Right, now, if I do the same, it's a key point, right? Here is which are not here. Exactly. The gravity that this needs to be attracted. is very important. This is very important when you have in mind the modified theories of gravity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. This is exactly where modifications of gravity can enter into the game. Precisely. Yeah. The relation between two. Without violating, in principle, any condition of something. Yeah. Um, yes, so now if I take psi a equals 0, 1, so this would be here. Now I have FA, which is so, okay, phi zero zero minus this is so. Right, so now I have the negative BT force, but the positive phi force, etc. Et From this kind of reasoning, you can see what is going on. I could have chosen a psi zero, which has, uh, which is non-real, which would be so, which would be a complex number that would correspond to an angle in, on the complex complex plane that is like this, for example, and this gives you the axis in which this shear thing happens. Because you can see that this is a shear, right? Extended here, compressed here. So geometrically speaking, Ricci is an isotropic focusing force of the light beam, just contracts the beam. While Viola is what we usually think about when we are talking about tidal forces, is the thing that does that those distortions, so shear things. And the interesting thing is that not only we understand geometri geometrically what is happening, but we also understand where those things come from. Because we know what kind of matter distribution generates Ricci or Vi. So, yeah. We have that geometrically. Ricci focuses while distorts. <coughs> and we also know that so for a given matter distribution. So if you have, for example, imagine a, a given distribution of matter here, yeah. so you have a given rho, and this is vector. Right. So given the Einstein field equation, we know that this thing, rich, the Ricci focusing and the, the Ricci tensor, they are related to the local T mu nu. They are related to what is the energy density here. So here energy density or the, I say energy density, energy and momentum density is non-zero so you have some reach so inside a given distribution of matter you have some reach focus so if you have light that crosses this cloud of matter could be a cloud, or could be a dark matter halo, could be a gas, can be anything then it goes, it's the effect of this local distribution of matter is going to focus the beam. This effect, the, the yellow effect. When you are going now outside from it, so you know that it's not because you are in vacuum, it's not because you have a richy flat region of space-time that you have no curvature at all. And the best example is the Schwarzschild metric. 
in the Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild geometry, even if you have just a peak of Ricci at the center, where the mass is, you know that all the rest of, the spa of space time is affected by it. And the kind of curve, even if you have Ricci equals zero everywhere, you have the rest of the Riemann curvature, which is the Bile tensor, that is not zero. So the Bile curvature is the kind of curvature which is generated outside from massive bodies. It, it translates the long, um, the long range character of the, of the gravitational interaction. So vacuum is Ricci flat. But the vial is not zero. And this matches completely the intuition that we can have about what is going on, right? You cross matter, you get focused, you pass by matter, close by, you get distorted by tidal forces. So this is just what's going on here. Yeah, tidal effects are not zero inside the matter. True, true, yeah, yeah, of course. The, the effect of vial can be completely non negligible inside the matter. But usually it's, well, if you do some orders of magnitude in most of the physically relevant situations, except when you have very anisotropic distribution of matter, it's really richly that dominant. And in particular, when we are doing cosmology, and we'll talk about that in the last lecture, weak lensing in cosmology. Uh, well, mostly takes into account the effect of Ricci. So we consider when, when we are crossing uh, matter. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Ricci generated within uh, dense regions, well, so uh, within matter distributions. is generated outside. Well, everywhere, but mostly outside, say. <coughs> you could say the, the, the Ricci focusing is due to the matter you're in, and the vial due to matter everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are other, of course, there are some uh, other situations. For example, if you're considering the, the Bianchi, <coughs> Bianchi one, for example, model for, for cosmology, so it's a homogeneous but anisotropic uh, universe. In this case, even if you are homogeneous, and so you have just a matter distribution everywhere, you have a non-zero vibe. The non-zero vibe being generated by the anisotropy of the, of the motion of matter. So that's why it's important to go also about momentum, because it's also, in this case, that's the momentum that generates the vibe. Well, that was just really good. So now let's talk about the Jacobi matrix. That is a very important tool in, in lensing. So even if this uh, psi quantity has been quite useful because we see physically what it represents, it allows us to do all those geometrical reasonings, it's not something which is very easy to handle at the level of observations. And uh, that's why we are going to introduce something else, so this matrix, the Jacobi matrix, uh, that we find the following way. So the Zach's equation, <coughs> Zach, oh, I forgot to say, to say that, but yeah, this thing we call that the Zach's vector equation. Sorry for that. vector equation d to psi a full bar a d psi d. So this thing is clearly linear and under the root of under the 
write continuity assumptions for the optical triangle matrix, it satisfies the Cauchy Lipschitz conditions. In particular, the, uh, the coefficient of the second derivative is non zero. No, it's one that never vanishes. So, we know from this theorem, Cauchy Lipschitz theorem, that any solution of this equation is linearly related to its initial conditions. Bit of math. So, so solution is linearly related to its initial conditions. So because it's a second order differential equation, the, 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 the initial conditions that I'm going to take at the observer are the initial value of xi, which is zero anyway, and its derivative, because we need those two initial conditions to get this, the, the whole solution. So, but yeah, as I said, at the observer, one of those initial conditions, so the initial value of xi at the observer is zero. So the only thing on which the, the solution can depend is the initial value of the derivative. So there must, so since at the observer, Oh. Psi a equals zero, but not necessarily psi dot. So for, from now on, I will call dot the derivative with respect to lambda. Since we have that, there must exist. A two times two matrix such that psi a at any lambda is this matrix times the initial value. Right, so just math. So far. TAB is called the Yakov matrix. <coughs> For reasons that are going to be here a bit later. It satisfies following system of equations. So first, it satisfies the same differential equation as, as psi, of course, as you can show just by taking the second derivative of this thing, this definition. So we have R, uh, A, C, D, C, B. By definition as well, At the observer, it is zero, and its first, its first derivative with respect to lambda at zero is just the identity matrix. Right. Now, now, what's more interesting is the physical, the geometrical meaning of this thing. Right, the first thing to 
Insert right here is what this thing needs. First, well, so psi dot a zero by definition, as I said, t psi a of a t lambda zero. So, what's your guess? What does that mean? What is the physical meaning or chemical meaning of this quantity? The initial derivative of psi with respect to the uh, alpha parameter. Are we guessing what it's equal to? What is? Sorry? Are we guessing what it's equal to? Yes. All right. Or I'm an interpretation. So it's the angle. The angle? Yes. Has something to do with the angle, the separation angle between the two light rays at the observer. So let's, and the first step to realize that is to remember what we discussed yesterday about the physical interpretation of the affine parameter. So you remember we have shown yesterday <coughs> that d lambda corresponds, is proportional to the proper length, proper distance. Um, that over which the, the photon travels from lambda to lambda plus d lambda, well, normalized by the frequency. So it's um, dl is over omega. So this thing first is omega zero, so the observed frequency, d psi a over L. And now we will make a small drawing. We have the observer here, well, spatial picture. So here we are at the observer, and here we are at lambda. We are talking here about D psi A. And here, about this, oh sorry, this is d lambda. Well, so I will take lambda equals zero to make things easier at the, at the observer. This is therefore d lambda, so small shift. And we know that this distance is omega, right? So dl or omega d lambda, okay, zero d lambda. And that thing here, I can call theta a. So of course I did everything in the plane of the, of the blackboard, but you can see that this, uh, well, this corresponds to a, to a two vector, so because we could have, uh, well, a two dimensional shift of, um, of this vector. So anyway, this theta a is t psi a over dl by definition, right? by considering small, small angles. So yeah, omega, zero, exactly. So yeah, this thing is the observed uh, angular separation between the two light rays, modulo, uh, yeah, a small, well, a, a, proportion, a proportional unity coefficient, which is omega zero. That is going to be quite important uh, in, in the rest of, uh, of the lecture. Uh, keep in mind that some people in, in textbooks or reviews choose by convention to put this thing to one, so that you have the, so that you have at the observer at least d lambda which is equal to dl. But it's actually a bad idea to put it in this kind of lecture directly to, to one because it uh, it explains a lot of things in the end. But just to finish on that. In the end, we can write this D A B as being something like this uh, um, 1 over omega 0 D psi A D psi B. So, oh, so this matrix is a map from the observed 
well, angles, angular separations, to the, uh, the physical separation between the rays when they are considered much far away after propagation. Did I put the, the omega zero in the right thing? Yes. Because if, if I know the expression of DAB for any lambda, I can say, I observe, I look at the sky, I observe a given um, shape, a given, well, a given image, I see something with a given angular size and angular shape, and just by multiplying this thing, this pattern that I see with the, uh, the Jacobi matrix, I can say, this source has this size, this physical size, and this physical shape. It has been distorted this way. So this thing is the central object of gravitational method. It is the thing that tells you everything that happens to a light beam. Before I, so I will not finish this thing, which is a bit longer uh, today. I have something like, I will need maybe 20 minutes for the next thing. So I will spend a bit of time talking about two things. The first is why, what I mean here by narrow light beams, physically speaking, and also will relate this thing to the area of a beam just a bit. So let me start with a remark. I also use the word infinitesimal. So what does that mean? Physically speaking, of course, infinitesimals are used to model things that are not infinitesimal, but in situations where we have a good hierarchy of um, of like, typical length scales, or typical, well, so in which you can consider things much smaller than other things. The question is, which thing is much smaller than which thing when I, when I say infinitesimal light beam or narrow light beam in this context? So, uh, the hint is, so there are a few things, but an essential one is, in which conditions can I write this thing? Which comes from the, the, the geodesic deviation equation. So the main issue is the validity of the geodesic deviation equation. Hence, <coughs> the next equation. And for it to be considered valid, well, there is a quite easy thing to notice is that I need this thing to be single valued within the, within the light beam. When I'm saying that the behavior between this light ray and this light ray is driven by the curvature, I need to be able to talk about one value of the curvature. I need the curvature to have approximately the same value here, 
here, here, well, any, anywhere, uh, sorry, anywhere in between the two light rays. So, I need our new new rule sigma to have a unique an approximately, well, or say even better, to be essentially <coughs> homogeneous within the bin. <coughs> Else it makes no sense to talk about our, our new neuro sigma or our AB as driving the evolution of uh, the difference between that and that. You mean on the screen upon passing oh. intersection? Yeah, yeah, that's the whole thing. But we feel that that is approximate. Well, that's. Well, on the screen when we are working with this whole thing, but because the whole. The whole Framework comes from the geodesic deviation equation. I think we need the geodesic deviation equation to be valid in the first place. But say maybe within a given iso lambda. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Hypersurfaces. But there is a, you get when you think a bit about it. There is no way this thing is true in any situation because uh, if we. Consider just uh, well typical length scales. So this, in terms of typical scales, that means that the say the diameter of the light beam locally. This thing, must be much smaller than the typical distance over which the curvature evolves. Which I can evaluate, for example, like uh, R mu nu rho sigma, R mu nu rho sigma, divided by some derivative of it. For example, this is the typical, the typical estimation of the curvature, well, to the uh, squared. Well, so this should be something like that. But what we know is, so if we consider just Ricci, well, that corresponds to typically be much smaller than something that looks like um, the distance, typical distance over which the density of matter evolves. But even if uh, I consider the propagation of a light beam like this through the air, I know that any two ray that I take will be separated by a distance which is bigger than, for example, the size of a proton. And I have very strong variations of curvature on the proton and outside from the proton. So, there is actually an issue here about why can we write all this thing? What is the... So, and even this Ricci and vile description that I have talked about, right? Uh, so, this thing is first never valid. And even if I come back to the Ricci Viola, well, this is something that depends on the resolution at which I consider the distribution of matter. I mean, by the same reasoning, you would argue that there isn't any Ricci. Eh, yeah. Because it's well, always in vacuum. Just depends. You could say, at, if you go to the quantum level, then everything is a field. So at the level of field, things <coughs> become Ricci. Yeah, but I mean, the map is know. not just. Uh, so, if I have a gas, for example, so is that Ricci? Well, 
Now, I zoom in. I've got molecules, right, with electrons and things. So actually, what I have here is vile, and what I have here is something which is richy. But this depends on the resolution. So there is actually something to understand in what uh, uh, the infinitesimal B means <coughs> in which situation this approximation can be valid and what is actually, what are the laws at work that make the whole thing work. Um, so this was just a teaser because there is a, a PF um, Arena and Uzon uh, uh, in preparation <laughs> about that. Just a teaser. So yeah, the they, coherence of the beam, hmm? because for this approximation to work, the beam should be coherent. Yeah. So what's happening here? I don't understand your question. <laughs> because we need k, yes. the null vector, to be actually <coughs> orthogonal to a hypersurface. Yes. Okay, this hypersurface have to have the same phase. Yes. So the bundle well, should be co <coughs> coherent. Yes, indeed. Well, the K is not the same everywhere at the hypersurface, right? The K in London, because they actually have to have a constant phase surface. Yes, indeed. So the bundle is coherent. Yes. But for resources in the universe? Well, they are. You can yeah. define a team new and new, which is coherent. Okay, but they are not coherent. I mean, they have random phases. Ah, coherent? Yes, coherent. Ah! Um, yes, indeed. You, you think you mean at the quantum level of the waves? Like sun. So, it's for the Ah, okay, I see what you mean. Right, right, right. Okay, okay, yeah. I see what you mean. Okay, so you say that an actual light source is not coherent, and I cannot talk about the phase of um, the Constant common phase surface. of two different points within this source. Yeah, okay, that's. Um, we are working in the context of geometric optics in which we forget about the actual wave nature of, of, the, of the electromagnetic signal. So we, we do as if all the sources were emitting a, a, co a coherent wave at the same time and we work as if it were the case. This is what we do in, in geometric optics uh, all the time. We never go into the details of the of the wave trains. Or I don't know how we say in uh, in English about that. So the fact that you actually have an, an activity, an electromagnetic activity of each source, which is very complicated, and that's not emitting all at the same time. No, yeah, we we forget about that. We do as if it were the case, and it works quite well. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So there are some mechanisms that make the, in particular, the. Uh, converge, the conversion of via to reach <coughs> and um, as you can see quite well with um, a, complex, uh, a complex formalism uh, applying the residue theorem, that's quite funny the way things are, uh, are acting a light beam depending on whether they are inside or outside the beam. Oh, that was just a teaser. Um, it's time. Thank you.